So I went on and I left it for a bit. I was I didn't know what had happened. I thought I was possibly gone mental. <clears throat> I just had to concentrate on physical things. So I had an idea that I'd go to Norway because I had rights to dual nationality and I went in their army and I was there for three years. I came back to England and sort of gradually coming back to myself in a sense and not so afraid that you know, I was going to go mental. And then in 2014, I had my, I had my um, baptism of fire, my born again <clears throat> moment. And that was some sort of 18 years, 19 years, no, hang on. It's 17, 18 years after the... The 1997 and when I looked in this reading this Bible and then it says he opened the seals and then there was a quiet in heaven for half an hour now it's often said that a day in heaven is like a thousand years on earth and in that sense, a half an hour is equal to 20 years. So about half an hour. So, you know, this, this was just the bits of scripture that got me excited. And then I found I was, I was understanding the scripture differently. If you read the scripture thinking there's only one begotten Son of God and he's the one doing everything then you're going to interpret it in another way if you understand that, you know, God isn't just going to use one of his children, God will use all of his children at some point. So let's just go from, because I just find it interesting, some of this. This is Revelation 4 to, At once I was caught up by the Spirit, there in heaven stood a throne, and on the throne sat one whose appearance was like the gleam of jasper and cornelian. And round the throne was a rainbow bright as an emerald. So there's one sat on the throne. Now, that's not going to be God. It might be the throne of God. But God doesn't sit on his own throne, if you like. God puts someone on his throne. There is a, you know, there will always be a first and a last, you know, so when you're in that position of being first, you'll be sitting on that throne. So there was one sitting on the throne. Now this must be Yeshua, because Yeshua had been at the top. And it can't be, it can't be God, because nobody's seen God. Do you understand? they will say that that was God. Or maybe they won't, but they'll say the next fella coming up is Yeshua, Jesus. In a circle about his throne were 24 other thrones, and on them sat 24 elders, robed in white and wearing crowns of gold. From the throne went out flashes of lightning and peals of thunder. Burning before the throne were seven flaming torches, the seven spirits of God. And in front of it stretched what seemed like a sea of glass, like a sheet of ice. In the centre round the throne itself with four living elk creatures, covered with eyes in front and behind. The first creature was like a lion and the second like an ox. The third had a human face and the fourth was like an eagle in flight. The four living creatures, each of them with six wings, had eyes all over, inside and out, and by day and by night, without pause, they sang. Holy, holy, holy is God, the sovereign Lord of all, who was and is and is to come. As often as the living creatures give glory and honour and thanks to the one who sits on the throne, who lives for ever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before the one who sits on the throne and worship him for lives for ever and ever, and as they lay their crowns before the throne they cry, Thou art worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honour and power, because thou didst create all things, and by, and thy, by thy will 
they were created and have their being. So obviously what I've just read there just completely demolishes what I've just said. <laughs> this, is, this is the problem with scripture, isn't it? So there I take Revelation 5. Then I saw in the right hand of the one who sat on the throne a scroll, with writing inside and out, and it was sealed up with seven seals. And I saw a mighty angel proclaim, proclaiming in a loud voice, Who is worthy to open the scroll and to break its seals? There was no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth able to open the scroll or to look inside it. So even if that was God on the throne, for him to say, this is John, for him to say there was no one in heaven or on earth or under the earth, because that's apparently where Yeshua was sent, able to open the scroll or to look inside it. So, even if that was God on the throne, which okay, it looks like from this scripture it was, at least in this vision, I was in tears because no one was found who was worthy to open the scroll or to look inside it. So it does beg that massive question, where was Yeshua then? But one of the elders said to me, Do not weep, for the lion from the tribe of Judah, the scion of David, has won the right to open the scroll and to break its seven seals. Look at the word scion. Fits in this little dictionary. No. Not spelt like that anyway. Oh, hang on. H I. Oh, yeah. Scion, a plant, shoot, cut off for grafting, a descendant of a family. Okay. has won the right to open the scroll and to break its seven seals. So, did I win the right when I did my journey to Africa? Now, I was, um, I had quit sixth form, took a year out, worked for a bit. I went to college, did photography, it was a you know, just wasting my time really, I just thought it'd be easy. And um, coming towards the end of my photography, I wasn't, you know, I was more into Stonehenge and stuff like that. Just driving off to these stone circles all the time and just wondering about them. And um, we had a visit from my, uh, we had got, some sort of second cousins who who in Africa and my dad lived in Africa when he was a child so so had this connection and he he was visiting from Africa he was a quite you know he was a lawyer well respected lawyer in Nairobi and um, and then my dad was saying to me you know you could go to Africa do a bit of travelling. Stay with, uh, stay with uh, Philip. And um, so that's what I did. I had to save up the money. I had to save well half. If I saved up five hundred quid, my dad would give me five hundred quid. That was the flight, and then five hundred quid spending money. So I did that. Um, by the skin of my teeth, in a way, <laughs> I nearly cocked it all up. But I was getting these feelings, and they were exciting. And when I say I get these feelings, there was an added dimension to them. It wasn't just a, a rumble in my tummy, it was, a, it was an all-encompassing feeling, 
and I remember I would just say like it tinted yellow a bit so it just had this sort of feeling it was exciting but also there was this slight trepidation about it anyway um, I go to Africa in like uh, sort of September some point that's when I fly out and uh, spend a month in Nairobi it's all fine but and he's giving me membership to the golf course and I'm playing golf and getting some spliffs off the caddies and um, it's pretty cool I've got this little motorbike that I can ride to the golf course and back but you yeah, know I would come out to Africa I don't just want to do this and he's showing me these places where I could work and you know sort of set my life up there in a sense if I wanted to I think they said at one point, you know, if I could go and be a, go and run a small tea plantation or something and have a few hundred people under me. I didn't want that. I just wanted to meet Africa. I wanted to find Africa. So then he had a friend visiting from Uganda and <clears throat> there's a woman uh, about 50 years old named Nina and she uh, she showed me this, she had this clipping cut out of sort of gorillas in the, in the jungle or in the forest and uh, she's like yeah you know come to Uganda you can see these and, cool awesome right so I'm going on a bus with her to Uganda and I start getting she's a strange woman very polite and everything but her, her skin wasn't that dark but her eyes were so dark and they had a purple tint, and I remember Roald Dahl's book about the witches with purple eyes. And, you know, I was, I was, she was seen really nice, but I was wary. So I get to where she lives in Entebbe. She's showing me around. She's showing me, like, where the people live and some of the hard work they have to do. She's right on the shore of Lake Victoria. And then... And down, so she, her house is sort of about 30 metres elevated and there's this sort of hill going down and there's this scrub where there are these two derelict aeroplanes. And this is right, you know, it should be a lovely beach there for Lake Victoria, but it's all covered with this weed. There's all this weed in the lake and everything. You can't swim there and nothing. It's, it was, you know, run down totally. And but she sends me down there to get this guy called Pontius. Uh, she you know he does some work for her and everything else. So automatic thing I do is um, do you know where I can get any cannabis? You know, da, 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 da. and he's like really into it. Yeah, you want to be a member and everything like this. And, you know, so obviously looking back, you know, she probably knew that you know that I would be like that, in a sense. Anyway, I do get these feelings pop back and and we arrange, me and this Pontius guy, we arrange it for me to go down on a Saturday night. I'm going to bring my camera, you know, spend the night smoking, talking. Because he had made this big thing, you know, we're members when we smoke, like, you're a member. You know, so it's feeling good and exciting and then as this day was approaching I was going to go down there these feelings <laughs> come really strong and I'm now, now now you know there's less excitement about them and a lot more like worry and um, so I decide to leave my camera and not take it because I think I'd already heard him say you know if he had two hundred dollars he could um, set up his own gold mine in the Congo, he'd done a bit of that before. Um, so I leave my camera and as I'm walking down there I'm seeing the the advertisement boards on the side of the road because I'm walking the roadway and I get and, the, and I know all the feelings I was getting before I went to Africa come back, this is this is what they were about and um, when I get down there, 
there's also there's a there's a disco going on about sort of thirty meters past where I'm turning off, but it's there's no windows in it. It's just this concrete bunker. It looks like the music you can hear is so loud. So I I go in where the airplanes are, and he's there, and then there's somebody else with him, and this guy's lying lying like near the water there is a bit of sand there he's lying on the sand and he's got this he's got a panga behind his head so a panga is like a, a big machete and um and he goes oh yeah he's a member too you know it's just like real it wasn't all the like the slowness of before and you know yeah man he's a member too yeah we're all members you know oh yeah he's a member too and then so he's he's smoking a spliff, lying down on his back, and he passed it to me, I have a few smokes. I can't remember how much smoked smoked a spliff or something, right? And he's just lying on his back, this other guy just doing nothing. And then Pontius is on the other side of him and I'm sort of lying back. And then Pontius suddenly pretends like he can see something over by the entrance. You know, oh, what's that? <laughs> and he starts going away. And I'm lying back and I'm thinking, you know, like he's leaving me and this guy alone. Because they have, also, I forgot, when I got down, the other guy, what he did do is, first of all, they were annoyed that I didn't bring my camera. And then there seemed to be some sort of hesitation. And they were looking at my jeans and my shoes and what I was wearing and stuff. And they were all pretty new, so, you know, it might have been between them, you know, is it worth it for the clothes, you know, sort of thing. And maybe it was, because Pontius went off. And I was lying up, uh, looking at the moon, and it's almost like it went red. <laughs> and I often wondered, like, if I did die that day, and I'd just be making the rest of this stuff up. <laughs> but I don't think so. Anyway, <clears throat> so I you know, and I got that strong feeling. I got that feeling, God, you dickhead, you absolute twat. What have you done? And so I just stood up really quickly and um, walked over towards where the aeroplanes were. And I sort of had to get myself together. I thought is. Because I don't know where Pontius had gone. I thought, is he going to jump down from one of the aeroplanes? He didn't. I walked under the aeroplane. I thought, get myself together. I had a piss. And then I walked over to the shed where he had put my jumper. Sorry, I obviously left that out. He had put my jumper and that in there. And I found a stick, because that was locked. But there was a light there. And I found a pretty decent sized stick. And I was just holding that, thinking, well, you know, if I'm going to go out, I'm going to go out with a fight. Anyway, so I managed, anyway, I got back in the air and made Pontius take me back and stuff. So it was okay. And there was a couple of other things that happened on that traveling trip. Because then I left there and I went to Fort Portal and I I stayed in a mud hut in the end for about a month and a half. And that was brilliant. That was the best bit of the holiday. But then on the way back as well, I, I just, because I ran out of money and I'd, been a bit ill, I'd had sleepy sickness. So I was going back and um, I was going to take some cannabis back with me because I'd got some really cheap good stuff out in Fort Portal. And uh, I said to this Nina woman, I said, um, I had this tub of it and I said, shall I take it? Would it be safe to take back into Kenya? And she was like, oh yeah, that's fine. So as soon as she said that, I threw it. <laughs> threw it away. I just stuffed some in my camera flash battery where the batteries would go. I shoved some in there. And I thought they're not gonna look in there. Anyway, lo and behold when I get in the bus I get in the night bus back to Kenya and we cross the border into Kenya and then they pull the bus over the police. And they want to speak to me <laughs> the only white bloke on the bus and they're getting suitcases out of the bus and they're pointing at them and going, Is this yours? So because of the point, everyone on the bus is like looking at me, what's he done, sort of thing. 
you know, I coolly go out and I show them this and that, this is my bag and I open it up and because I was calm they didn't want to search it but they were looking for me. I would have been in so much shit if that would have happened. So, and then when I got back into my second cousin's place and he said, right, well, we better get you back to England. And I'm like, you know, it was a real change. I never suspected anything at the time, but, you know, as I marked for slaughter. And was my dad involved? That I don't know. I can't imagine. But he, um, he need, he wanted a favour, Philip wanted a favour of Nina. She knew the um the leader of was it the ex leader of Idi Amin? Idi Amin? Something like that. But she knew people that could help Philip become a judge and that was what he wanted. But uh, you know, who knows what other shit might have gone on whether he owed a one, who knows. Um but I had this so I had this different feeling and I was standing in his house and I looked at the there's a, a roof window, like skylight. And I looked out and Orion was there. And I had this I had this I had another feeling, it was different. It was uh, it felt further away. But in my mind there was this, there was a house and it had, there was cogs, it was some sort of, op, there was something, some sort of machinery working, some sort of new technical machinery. And I kind of understand that now, it's very much like this house, like those stairs there. And the machinery isn't in the house, it's, it's the soul dis discovered, anyway that was... But anyway, I get back to England, and and within a couple of weeks, I'm going with my friend to her college on the bus in the morning, and me and her had been getting some of these feelings at the same time before I was going to Africa. We were sort of very deeply connected, and um, and then on the bus, I was going, I've got that feeling again, you know, or is it? but this one's different and she wasn't getting it and it bothered her I could tell it bothered her she thought oh he's going mental um, so she had less to do with me after that but that was the year so there was that feeling and then a couple of months later another one and then a month later another one and each one had a different colour associated with it it wasn't just straight the colours of the rainbow. I say that first one was a sort of a champagne. I can't remember if there's a green one, but I'm sure there was. It was definitely a blue one because that was the blue sky, and it was like the abyss in the blue sky. Then there was a red one because it was a red truck, but there was another red one because it was the setting sun in August. Then there was a black one. And then the final one was a white one, and that was the one that just blew me away. Right, so I want to get to the bit where there was a half an hour. Right, so so it opens the first seal, opens the second seal, third seal, fourth seal, fifth seal, break the sixth seal. Uh, mentions the hundred and forty-four thousand. Now, when the, so this is Revelation 8. Now, when the Lamb broke the seventh seal, so he broke the seventh seal, 
There was a silence in heaven for what seemed half an hour. So it's not exactly half an hour for what seemed half an hour. And if a day is a thousand years, half an hour is about 20 years. Pretty close, actually. Then I looked, and the seven angels that stand in the presence of God were given seven trumpets. So there is a pause there. There is a pause there before the trumpets are to be blown. And if since 2014 the trumpets have been blowing and I know there's a load of bowls to pour out and everything else, I was, find revelations one of the most confusing <laughs> confusing things in there. But I you know, I think there are bits written and then bits added to it because people want to explain, don't they? They don't want to translate and write something which is going to uh, just confuse people so I don't know if they add bits but you you take these the bits where the meat is where the where the real sort of you know when they're just going oh glory glory to God blah, 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 you know there's a lot of waffle and babble in there but when you've just got that meat that those couple of lines that have so much information if they're taken correctly and they're often not <coughs> So, I had my, so 2014, I had my born again moment, and I knew, you know, it was like, it, how could I not have associated it with God? It was, it was, of course it was all God, but I didn't really understand at the time, like, God that much because it's a big thing to understand isn't it God you got to understand what you are as well to help you understand what God is but um, I was able to repeat the the feeling I was able to to recreate conditions and that these feelings would occur, and they wouldn't be this. It'd never be the same twice. I mean, that's one of the things with God is it's just never exactly the same twice, unless you're doing it wrong, probably. And it was the third one, I think, so the third time of having getting into these feelings that I felt that sense of God was saying to me, "You." you I want you for something you got something to do and it brought me back and I was going to mention this is one of the reasons why I think I why I know who I am when I, so before I went to Africa and stuff and I was getting these feeling feelings like I was Jesus right and I said to a friend of mine that had got into religion and stuff, and I said, I worry that I'm Jesus. You know, and I, I was a bit worried about what he was going to say and if he was going to tell everyone, and he didn't. He just said to me, it's a sin to worry. So I thought, yeah, cool. I won't worry about it, you know. Um... So and this and so I got then I saw on the third time feeling this and I get this feeling like you like and I'm like nah because you know I'd been into this A J Miller and you know he's Jesus he says he's Jesus so you know I, I mean I was a bit confused and then but a few months later it happened again and the second time that it happened. That I was getting this feeling, I, you know, you, you're the one I got something to do, something. I told my mum, and you know, she was obviously mortified. <laughs> like, what? <laughs> well, you're not going to hurt anyone, are you? No, I'm not going to hurt anyone. It's all loving. Well, that's okay then, as long as it's all loving, that's fine. But she was like, oh, don't tell anyone, you know. <laughs> don't tell your son. Oh, gosh. 
So I did him. I kept it to myself again. And um, and then a few months later, I was dying. I seriously, I had some flu or something, but I was dying. I, I just seriously, it was killing me. And I was at work. I had a job at the time. I was, um, I'm self-employed, so I've always got a job. But I was doing some extra part-time work. Uh, looking after people with autism because also wanted to understand like you know are they insane and no they're not but anyway so I was lying in the sleeping room just thinking I'm gonna fucking die and then I was like in my head I was like come on you are the one <laughs> and as soon as I said it I just thought, embrace that feeling. And I was better instantly. I was instantly. And at the time things have been, I was thinking to myself, yeah, God sort of is now appealing through the physical. I had no choice. Die or embrace that feeling. So I embraced the feeling, and that was July the 8th, 2015. And then I made a video, sort of subtly saying about it, in uh, August, because I was holding it in, but I told my son. The holiday we had that year was interesting, we drove south of France and that, but we went sort of via Switzerland, just briefly and we camped out and and I got up in the middle of the night for a piss I really needed a piss and I looked up at the stars and it was amazing every star had like a something round it like a, a, a sort of a bigger not just a bad eyesight twinkle but more like a a shimmer and a frost around it. And there were no clouds or anything. So I don't know why it looked like... You know, sometimes when you're still a bit asleep and you get, and it's, the vision's a bit grainy. It could have been that. It just looked so amazing. But I was so tired and I so needed a piss that I didn't spend that much long looking at it. And also, the moment that day, July the 8th, and I couple of raspberry bushes that have never provided me with a raspberry in my front garden. That day I went there and there were two perfect raspberries. So, you know, obviously I was, because I've actually, you know, I, I embraced it. I embraced it for all the rest of 2015, all of 2016. All of 2017 and partly through 2018, I'd say. I began to sort of think, yeah. What? I don't know. I've done, I've done what I've done. I've done what I came to do. Because all what I was doing in those times, I was thinking, you know, am I supposed to go to London and speak as corner and tell everyone? Blah, blah, blah. But what came to me was that I just had to get the truth. I just had to answer these questions that I had in my head, like, where did we come from? You know, what are we? Where are we going next? What's God in this? Has God got a mum and dad? What's the eternal one love? What is... What's outside of the universe? You know, I had these questions and I did get answers to them and I've made videos giving the answers. And I, I, I will put a link in this one. I will. So, so I, I, I guess in the last half a year 
I sort of, you know, the YouTube channel never took off or anything, so I guess I just sort of, well, I've done done what I can and leave the rest to God. And I'm not totally saying that I'm not the one anymore, but it's is it a big deal? Do I, you know, what difference do, will it make to my life? Actually, none, because I still, from what I've learned, you know, what I get from life is... It's just about the normal things, like interaction with people and my son and myself and you know, just and nature and watching what's happening to the world. I mean, blind me. So this this is how I know, and I suppose this is. This has been an interesting thing that's happened with Tommy Robinson and also hearing about the the Messiah the Jewish stuff about the Messiah Ben Joseph and the Messiah Ben David. So we'll see. We will see. Um yeah. So I think I've explained it from my point of view, how I know who I am.